Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, Life Church. I worship, I bless, I lift up, I exalt the great name of Jesus. Come on and help me. You know the song it says. We love to Hallelujah. Call your name. It's something hey. we cannot explain. That happens, that happens when we proclaim.
Hallelujah. We wanted to bring something a little different for you uh, again today. So I'm here at the keyboard. And um, it's truly my prayer that God would just um, touch the church. Um, not just life church, not just the local church, but the universal church. And um, I'm sure that's the prayer of uh, every believer. We need the spirit of God to dwell amongst us and to just give, a, just give us another touch from the Lord.
Hello Life Church, this is Pastor Ben here and I am grateful that you guys have decided to join us during this virtual worship experience. I want to say a welcome to our first time visitors. We're so glad that you guys are able to connect with us on this Sunday. And thank you to all of our members who are checking us out online. We are having our very first house hubs at this moment. Yeah, give it up for all those who came out uh, to our first house hubs, which is basically a small group setting where we uh, still have online service, but we come together uh, to be able to sing praises to our God in a house and also discuss the word of God after the sermon and eat together, just like the early church 
did. I'm very grateful that you guys have decided to do that. And I know that the conversations we're going to have after service are going to be very fruitful and encouraging for each and every one of us as we fellowship together. We will be doing the same thing next week. We'll have another location that we, we uh, put out in the Pulse as well as in our text blast. So be sure to be on the lookout. All right, guys, this week we are going to have Bible study at Tuesday or on Tuesday at 7 p.m. via uh, Zoom as well as YouTube and Facebook. So you guys can uh, join in on any one of those platforms as we continue looking at the benefits of the Bible, uh, charting out Psalm 119. Be sure to check us out there. And then we're going to have prayer this Thursday at 7 p.m. via Zoom. So make sure you connect with us on that as well. Be sure to also uh, let us know your prayer requests because we do want to make sure that we're praying for the needs of the church and uh, coming together uh, so that uh, as a body, we are doing what God has called us to do together. Go to our Lord and Savior about all of our requests. Now, me and Hope have great news. Some of you guys already got the information through our emails, uh, but we uh, ended up passing the SEND Network Assessment this week. Praise God. So that means that we are officially a part of the SEND Network now, uh, and uh, we will be benefiting from training and resources and connections from different churches and all that uh, in terms of the ministry of Life Church, which is a great and awesome thing. We are not out here alone, and we are moving forward in this church plant season. God is truly good, truly amazing, and he's sharpening the vision and the trajectory of our church. I want to make sure that you guys do know uh, that we are not going to be meeting at the Southern Area uh, Aquatic Recreation Complex next week. So be sure to stay in tune with our announcements uh, as well as the Pulse and Text Blast to know when we are having service. Uh, again, we are not having service next Sunday at the Southern Area Aquatic Recreation Complex. We will be doing house hubs another house location and the information and details of that will be sent out this week so you guys can stay connected and for those who aren't going to attend that be sure to still connect with us on online service at this point we're going to have giving uh, if you guys could text give to the number that's on the screen we would greatly appreciate any contribution you would give to the ministry of our church we are so grateful for the continued support of those of you who are connected to our church and we're thankful uh, that you are not only giving to this ministry, but you're praying for this ministry as well. All right, everyone, we are going to continue in our sermon series looking at the book of Ephesians. And we're going to talk about some things that I think are going to be really enlightening and encouraging for our hearts and our minds. I pray that you guys are blessed by what is said. And I'm going to see you in a few moments. All right. Hello again, Life Church. This is Pastor Ben here, and I am grateful uh, for this opportunity to share in God's word with you. I pray that wherever you are, uh, you are in a space where you are able to receive the word and will be encouraged by what is shared as we go to the holy text. I'm going to pray and we're going to dive into uh, the scriptures and continue in this series in the book of Ephesians. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, God, for the loving kindness that you've shown us. We thank you, Lord, for encouraging our hearts and our minds with your holy word and giving us an opportunity and a space to be able to meditate on what you've said and to seek to apply it in our lives and to consider it as we go about this Christian journey. Father, I ask that you would hide me behind your cross and you would let your word take center stage and grab hold of the hearts of the listeners, uh, that they would walk out your good and perfect will and that they would uh, have the miracle of obedience take place in their lives and their minds. Help us all, not just to be hearers of this, but to be doers as well, Lord God. Uh, Father, we're asking that you would get the glory and that you would be, uh, you would be um, lifted up through what is said. I ask, Lord, that you would also encourage uh, the hearts and the minds of the people by having me articulate the word clearly and effectively as I seek to honor your holy name. 
Ask all these things and trust and believe in your power to do this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. We've been doing a, um, ser a series in the book of Ephesians uh, and just checking out Ephesians chapter 1 thus far, uh, where Paul is speaking to the church in Ephesus about how blessed they are to be believers. And he basically does this by outlining different spiritual blessings that they have in Christ Jesus. And we're going to continue this list of spiritual blessings that he's pointing out and um, look at it from a, a very uh, interesting angle. All right. Ephesians chapter one, verse seven and eight. Ephesians chapter one, verse seven and eight. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Have you ever thought about how obsessed it seems like we are uh, with being rich in this country? Uh, how, how much people focus on the wealthy, uh, what they can do, what they have, the access that they uh, seem to always be able to get a hold of, the, 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 the beautiful things that they seem to wear and the, the extravagant vacations they go on, the, the lifestyle that comes with them being wealthy. Uh, something that people oftentimes search now is the net worth of people because we all seem to have this interest in wanting to know how much someone makes, uh, how wealthy is a person and sometimes put ourselves in their position because it's just a, a, a wonderful fantasy to, to, to hold on to for a few moments. Man, if I had this much money, if I had uh, this kind of bank account, things would be so much easier it is the the thought process of many of us today and it really revolves around uh, this obsession with the rich uh, whether it's those who are not wealthy wishing that they would be wealthy or it's the wealthy seeking to get wealthier this is something that we think about in our context and in our culture Back in the day, there was a show between 1985 to 1995 uh, that came on known as the Lifestyles of the Rich and the Famous. And what this show was all about was breaking down all of the purchases and evidences of extremely rich individuals. And they would just go through what they own, what they have, what they can get to show how rich these individuals are. And people tuned into this show for 10 years because they were so enamored with the lifestyle of those who have a lot of money. Now, why am I bringing up? A topic like this? Why am I uh, starting this with this discussion of a show like this or our obsession and fixation with uh, being rich? Well, I think Paul in this passage that we just read is doing something very similar to what the show Lifestyles of the Rich and the Famous did. Paul is uh, seeking to break down to the believers in Ephesus uh, the spiritual richness that God has and that they have because they are now Christians. We have to remember the church in Ephesus was a church that was in a culture, in a city that was known to have a lot of wealthy people where commerce was booming and where there had to be several people in their congregation who would be considered wealthy. So Paul talking about an idea of spiritual blessing and richness starts to uh, 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 recalibrate the church in Ephesus and their thinking concerning what being rich really is and what richness really matters. Paul outlines 
the spiritual blessings of the believer and it as evidence of the riches of God's grace. Paul outlines the spiritual blessings that the Christian has and it being those things being evidence of the riches of God's grace. The same way that the show Lifestyles of the Rich and the Famous breaks down the purchases of these rich individuals to show how rich they are. The spiritual richness Paul talks about in this passage is to the praise of God's glorious grace. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, 5 through 6, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the, the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And it's according to the riches of his grace. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. So the richness that we are seeing Paul is talking about here is connected to the grace of God, the abundance of God's grace. Now, what's interesting about this, if we track this idea through, and we think about this show, Lifestyles of the Rich and the Famous, and the different things that they would jot out to show how rich the individuals were. I think we can give or we can show or see a direct line to what Paul talks about in this passage concerning the richness of God's grace and it being a blessing to us. So what we're going to do is we're going to break down Lifestyles of the Spiritually Rich and the Blameless. Y'all like how I flipped that a little bit, right? That is us. And we're going to see if the Christian passes each test that this show uh, would talk about on a spiritual level and how that should impact how we feel as Christians. First indication I want to look at that the show would point out to show so how someone is rich uh, is they would point out where the individual lives and that would be how they would assess how rich they are like uh, they would go over uh how big the person's mansion is they would say they live in this home and it's this many square feet and it has these things inside of it and it's in this expensive neighborhood and this is an assessment of how rich they are now, I know people who who just for fun like to look up the mansion of extremely rich peoples and uh, uh, examine what what uh, great lengths they go to to have privacy and seclusion and how huge their places are. Billionaire Elon Musk has a sixty two point five million dollar mansion. Now, he is a. Uh, extremely rich genius and his purchase of this place and the value of this place speaks to the wealth that he has. How do we apply this to the spiritual richness that the believer has? Well, Paul begins this portion of the text by saying, in him, we have redemption. In him, referring to something Paul says a lot in the text, in Christ, in him. This reference or this statement is used several times to remind the believer that his position, his or her position is in Christ Jesus. That is where we live when we put our faith in the Lord. And being in Christ Jesus is being in the most valuable person who's ever lived. <laughs> let's let's look at passages that talk about Christ's worth so we can really see how to assess this and understand the spiritual richness that takes place in the life of the believer and that comes from God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 through 20. We went over this in the Supreme series. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation and invisible, whether th uh, uh, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, 
All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the first born from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus is valuable. Christ is valuable and we are in him. We live in him. Ephesians chapter one, verse 21 through 23 says that Jesus is far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which he is bought, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. If this is the value of Christ and we're in Christ, what does that say about the riches of God's grace? <laughs> you ever walked in someone's house and started thinking to yourself, wow, what job does this person have? How could they afford this place? You, you just looking at the place and admiring it and it starts causing you to wonder how much they actually have because you know this space is, a, uh, is, is, is expensive. So you start thinking, how much does this cost? What does it cost? What did it cost you to live here? <laughs> you know, the cost of being in Christ is the cross. In him, we have redemption through his blood, right? And grace is the currency that's spent for it. <laughs> Not only is Jesus of great value, it was expensive for us to live in him. It took him literally giving his life so we can live in him. We are rich. And the God who spent grace that we would actually live in Christ is eternally, abundantly rich. In the same way Paul is, is hitting on that nerve for the church in Ephesus, he's causing us as we think about the value of being in Christ Jesus and the riches of grace that allow for us to be in Christ Jesus. He's causing us to assess how important that type of richness is. More important than any of the riches in the world. Now, another measurement of richness that was detailed on the show was what a person has. So it wasn't only just the fact that they lived in a particular place, but it's also what they have. What did their garage look like? The private jets, all these different things that they have in their possession. Uh, Jay Leno, who was a famous uh, late night host, extremely rich man is noted to have a garage that has 160 motorcycles and 181 cars totaling over 150 million dollars worth of automobiles that speaks to wealth if your garage is just 150 million dollars it speaks to how wealthy you are to have that for just what you choose to drive whenever you drive. So what do we have? Paul says that in Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Now understand, because this gift is something we have, we are rich, but it primarily shows how rich God is because he's the one who paid for it. So in order to understand how valuable uh, this possession is for us, we have to know what redemption is. Redemption, simply put, is being set free from sin and taken in by God. The, the picture is like a, a land 
uh, that was owned by the children of Israel at some point that they lived in, that they were a part of, that was then taken from them and they didn't have access to. And then God, through his power and might, gave them the land again. They're redeemed. Uh, it's the picture when we think of salvation of us being created by God for his purposes, for his use, then us sinning and being corrupted and being under the rule of Satan. And then God, through Christ Jesus, brings us back into his his favorable hands, his use now, and we are considered redeemed. It's to be set free from sin and taken in by God. Now, why is that critical for us? Well, that's important because sin is what enslaves man. It's what damages man. It's what damages everything. It's what separates us from God and puts us under the rule of Satan. To be set free is to be uh, uh, set free from the enslavement and rulership of the enemy. Now, why is it so good? Because sin ruins everything. Sin is what tarnishes every experience we have. Whether it be a good meal, a good job, a, a goal or endeavor, uh, how we view ourselves, how we view others. Like, sin ruins everything. To have been redeemed is to be set free from the ruiner of all things. It's to be set free from an overbearing, sinful boss <laughs> and a messy stain on our record. I don't know if you guys have ever had an overbearing boss, had to work for somebody who just, oh my goodness, they micromanage everything, they nag all the time, they're extremely abrasive. Oh, it feels bad to be in those type of situations. It's oppressive. It's uncomfortable. You don't want to go into work. Well, when you are not in Christ Jesus and you're under the rule of Satan, that oppressive boss is always there, always distorting everything. Every new relationship. Oh, he's going to mess that up. Every new opportunity. Oh, it's going to be messed up in some way. Every new chance to be able to grow in your own personal skill sets, in your own uh, emotional health. Sin is there to mess that thing up. Because God sent Jesus Christ to save us, to die for our sins on the cross, because he's rich in grace and mercy and brought that to, to pass, we now have something called redemption, the forgiveness of our trespasses, and that oppressive boss is no longer over us. Not only that, the messy stain of sin no longer is what holds us back. You guys know how it feels when you have a nice outfit on. You have something that you you, 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 you tried your, your best to put together well. You want to keep clean and all of a sudden it gets stained. Ruins the whole flow of the outfit. And everywhere you go with that outfit on, that stain is there uh, uh, being a blemish to what could be an otherwise beautiful presentation. Well, that's what sin is for us. And to have your sins forgiven is to have the messy blemish of sin uh, removed from your record. That's what it means to be redeemed. That is of immense, great value because you don't have the chains of feeling like you are in some way completely tarnished or tainted because of sin in your life. Everyone is marred by sin unless the Lord forgives their trespasses. And that's why Paul says, in him you have redemption, the forgiveness of trespasses, because redemption is the forgiveness of trespasses. And the only way you can be removed from the oppressive rulership of Satan and uh, have the messy stain of sin removed is if God forgives you. Forgives those sins. But how? How does God forgive sins? I mean, I know that may seem like a crazy question, but... All of us have to be real about it. We really do ask that question before the Lord a lot. Because when we think about what we've done, what we do, what we think, what we say, 
If we're honest, we look at that and say, man, I would disqualify myself from any type of actual relationship with you, Lord. How do you forgive me? I was talking to my uncle recently about some loans uh, that I had taken out for school and we were discussing the possibility of of having those loans forgiven because, you know, everybody and their mama's talking about student loan forgiveness now. And as we started to assess which loans could be forgiven and which loans wouldn't be forgiven, uh, what was clear is that the loans that are forgiven are those that are from the government. Which makes sense because the government's the one who's issuing this mandate out to be able to forgive for federal loans that have been given. To forgive for what the government has given. Well, why can the government do that? there, but they can't do it for a private loan. That's because the government has the authority to forgive what they gave, to forgive in the place where they have authority. They can only forgive what they are owed. Here's the beauty of being forgiven by God. Every single one of our sins are ultimately sins against God. So when God says he's forgiven our trespasses, it doesn't matter what aspect of life you sinned in, what corridor, what particular dark space, what situation, what job, what scenario, whatever it may be, God is the one with the authority to forgive it because he's the one who we've sinned against and he's the one who we are in debt to. That's good news, y'all. Because we don't have to sit and scrutinize and question all day whether or not God has truly forgiven us. It's right here in the text. And if you're still asking how, how could God still forgive me knowing that I am in debt to him because of these things that I've done? I hear what you're saying about him having the authority to do so. Remember, Paul communicates to the church in Ephesus. It's because he's rich. He's rich. It's because he's rich. That's the answer. He's rich in grace. There's a film uh, called The Justice League, and it shows all these different superheroes, uh, Batman being one of them. And these superheroes come together and they're talking and you got Aquaman who can do cool things with the water. And you have Wonder Woman who's super strong and has these cool weapons. And you have a Superman who's very strong and can fly and do all this stuff. And you have the Flash who's extremely fast. And you got Cyborg and he can do all these mechanized things and all of these different superheroes. And as they come together, they look at Batman who is famously known as the superhero who has no powers. And someone asks him, what's your superpower? And you know what he responds and says? He says, it's I'm rich. I'm rich. That's my power. They were asking, how are you even in this group? How do you do what you do? I'm rich. <laughs> Yo, we spend so much time wrestling and struggling with the sins that we commit, the things we've done wrong, with guilt, with shame, with hurt, with 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 all of these these dark clouds that crowd over us whenever we've done something wrong and we act like God's not rich. God's not rich in the very thing that we need most. Grace. We fathom this. We understand this because we have something called redemption. And to have redemption is to be rich. Spiritually rich where it counts in the area of freedom from sin and it being removed from your record. So you're presented as blameless before God. Now, I know what you're thinking. Okay. All that's great. That can help me stop fixating on my mistakes and 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 it helps me to say no to sin and and I don't have to walk around in shame anymore, right? But when we talk about this rich blessing, this rich blessing, I still just feel messed up. I still struggle with this thing. I want to encourage you to stop meditating on 
sins. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take sin in your life seriously and you shouldn't do everything to fight sin. But think about a situation where you go out to eat with someone and you know they got it. I mean, let's be very clear. You know they are extremely rich. They've paid for your food before. They do it all the time. And, 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 and it's become such a pattern that you never have to pay for anything. But every time you sit down at the table with them to eat, you start going through all of these loop-de-loops around in your head about, oh, am I going to pay? Are they going to pay? I don't want to be uh, 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 too presumptuous and I, 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 I don't want to seem like I'm just taking from them. You go through all that stuff. When they're exorbitantly rich, they always pay for your food. They do it every single time. And they're going to do it again. They always got the bill. This is how we are with God. See, the forgiveness of our sins isn't even a dent in God's rich grace bank account. But we're the ones who's struggling, who's sweating, and who's 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 so obsessed and fixated on it, uh, goes through all these lengths to, 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 to feel horrible, which then runs us to more sin. And God's like, I got it covered because I am rich. I've taken care of it and I've set it up so that it's always taken care of. You see, these things, being in Christ, having redemption and the forgiveness of trespasses, shows that we are spiritually rich, but it's only because God is spiritually rich. And that leads to the last portion I think is so powerful. Because that show, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, uh, would, would deal with these different levels of being rich. And there were some people on the show who were just born rich because of who they were related to. And that was another method that they used to show how rich someone was, who you're related to. And we talked about this last uh, week. We are sons of the father when we believe in Christ Jesus, which means when we are born again, we are born again, rich into a rich family. We know about some rich families, the royal family, the Kardashians. I'm sorry. I know it's a big contrast between those two. But look. These are people who are rich, born rich because of the father. Do you know you're born again into a spiritually rich family, uh, unto a God who is rich in grace? See, that's why Paul continues by saying, according to the riches of God's grace, of his grace. See, redemption is not given according to our pockets, but the richness of God, our father. And our struggle with believing that he's able to forgive sin and he has enough grace for us is because we're assessing God's forgiveness based on our ability to cover our sin. You know, if I'm sitting at the table with the person who's going to cover the tab and I know that we're eating uh, lobster and shrimp and all this expensive stuff and I know I don't got the money for it. Well, then I'm definitely going to feel uncomfortable because I'm taking on the bill myself. And this is what we do. We forget your father is rich in grace. Stop trying to cover what you can't cover when God has already covered it. You know how you know that you're trying to cover what God has already covered? When you have the immense anxiety and overwhelming shame and depression uh, because of sin, because what you're saying is there, there is something that you have to, to give in order to compensate for what's happened when God is saying, I already gave it all and I'm rich with what actually pays for this and has paid for it. We're rich. Spiritually, because our father is rich with grace. You know, I, I 
was going somewhere to get some food one time and remembered right before I was about to pay that I left my wallet at home. And I was like, oh man, I can't pay for this thing because I left my wallet at home. And the cashier said, well, do you have anything connected to your phone where you can pay it? You can literally just tap your phone on this thing and, and it'll pay. And I'm like, oh, I think I kind of do. I don't know. So I drive back home, get my wallet, and then realize that my phone actually did have the capacity to pay. I had a wallet on my phone, a digital way of doing that. And when I when I learned about how to do this, I started understanding how you could go from a credit card to a phone to pay for different things. Because all that really needs to happen is there just needs to be some communication or connection between whatever you about to pay and the bank. As long as that connection happens, either through a digital apparatus or through a, 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 a physical card, as long as there's enough in the bank and there's a connection to what's in the bank, then that can be paid for. Whatever it is you have to pay for. Guys, because our God is rich in grace, because his bank is so full with grace, because we are connected to this bank through Christ Jesus, Every single sin pinpointed can be paid at any time because of that security. The only question we need to ask whenever there's a sin that comes up that we need to know or have assurance that it's paid for is, is there grace in the bank? And this scripture lets us know that there is and there always is. There's some more scripture that lets us know this. Ephesians chapter two, verse three through seven. But God Verse four through seven, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Jesus, the Lord has saved us and he gave us redemption to show the immeasurable riches of his grace. That's unending. You can't measure how much grace God has, that richness. And because you got a rich father, he's just dispensing that grace on every single sin, every single shortcoming, because he knows. That more than anything else that you can get in this life, you and I are going to need grace. Rest in this richness. We focus so much on the debt, on the sin stain, that we don't look at the abundance of the grace in the bank. <laughs> That's what Paul's trying to get them to see. You guys have the most valuable currency in all of existence because God, your father, is rich in grace. And this wasn't an accident. God did this on purpose. He knows what we need. He knows what we're going to do. And he's already allotted the grace needed for us. And he has an immeasurable supply. That's why Paul says, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. He's thought through every detail of grace that we need for the journey in this life. Because he knows with all the money in the world, all of the materials, all the, the automobiles, all the, the houses, all of the acclaim, all of the affirmation, it would mean nothing if you're under sin and unforgiven. There are people with an abundance of wealth, but they're trapped, oppressed. They move around with a messy stain of sin. And most importantly, it puts a wedge between them and their creator. 
You can't be truly fulfilled or navigate the internal turmoil with external pleasures or material things. And God knows that. So he said, listen, I'm going to just pour out grace on my children. Y'all, when you understand that grace and how it's afforded us redemption, your whole identity changes. You start going back and forth with yourself about what was done and you start moving forward to turn away from sin, to turn towards righteousness. People can even bring up what you've done, but you know the word says, I'm so grateful. Yes, I'm guilty, but guess what? The God I serve is rich in grace and he doesn't just hold that grace. He's not rich with it and doesn't give it out and is stingy with it. He lavishes it on me with all wisdom and insight. Every area I need grace to move forward in, he's pouring it out. Every place where I feel ashamed, he's pouring out that grace. Every place where I've just outright been wrong, he's pouring out that grace because I am redeemed. My father is spiritually rich and he pours out this rich grace upon me and allows for me to move forward in this life without the bondage and chains of the world. And that richness gives me joy in the midst of difficulty. That richness helps me persevere when things get hard. That richness allows for me to be able to dismiss the lies that the enemy tries to put in my mind or others try to put in my mind. That richness is what strengthens me all the more to not fixate on whether or not I can attain this or get that or get this because I am rooted in the reality that my father is rich and therefore I am rich with what I need, grace, grace, grace. I pray that the next time you feel like you don't have enough or you need more or you've done too much wrong, that you remember God has lavished you with the greatest currency in all of existence, grace. And that is powerful enough to be a firm foundation and anchor in every season and state you can find yourself in. We have been born again into a rich royal family. And because the God we serve is rich in grace, we can keep going. We can keep moving. We don't have to stay stuck or be paralyzed in analyzing our shortcomings because God has given us redemption and many other spiritual blessings according to the riches of his grace. I'm so glad I serve a God who's rich in grace because I need it. I don't know about you, but I need grace. I am not perfect in any way. I need grace upon grace. And I'm grateful that the Lord in his foresight and his knowledge and his understanding knew exactly what I would need and knew that I would come across this passage and recognize that wherever I find myself in, I will never say that God doesn't have grace for me in my situation. He does. And that grace empowers me to walk out the faith. It's grace that's afforded to us because of what Christ has done. Hallelujah. Because of what God has prepared beforehand. We need only rest in it. Trust in the God who gives it. His bank account is overflowing with it. We need only to trust him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your grace, Jesus. Father, none of us are perfect. Hallelujah. But you've, you've given us such a wonderful gift, so many gifts. Help us to not beat ourselves up. Help us to not to re receive when others try to beat us up and, 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 and try to take away from who we are, who you've made us to be, Lord. Remind us that you're rich in grace. You don't withhold that grace, but you pour it out upon us. Hallelujah. Every time we struggle, 
with how we can move forward, how we can forgive ourselves, how can we do anything else in life, Lord, remind us, whisper in our ears, I'm rich in grace. Hallelujah. And I saved you to show you the immeasurable riches of grace that I have and my kindness towards you. Let us never who are in Christ Jesus feel like God hates us. He wants to destroy us. Let us always remember he wants to empower us with the grace that he lavishes upon us with all wisdom and insight. Help us to meditate on this, to talk about this in house hubs and to think on this throughout the week and be encouraged as the enemy tries to attack us to know you give grace that we can continue going. You saved us from sin. You set us free from the horrible boss and oppressor. You remove the blemish from our record and brought us into this awesome family where we are lavished by our Father who loves us dearly. Thank you, Lord, for this great reality. Bless us to be able to walk in this. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All right, guys, love you all. Pastor Ashley is going to share the gospel. Uh, and for all of you guys in House Hubs, we're going to talk about some of the questions uh, that were passed out earlier and discuss the sermon and pray for each other and just uh, fellowship and eat together uh, and um, consider what the Lord has communicated to us uh, today. I love each and every one of you, and I pray you guys were blessed by what was said, and I'll see you all next time. Well, I know that that message was truly encouraging and convicting to your heart. And my friend, if you're listening to this message right now and you realize I don't have a personal relationship, a true fellowship with Christ Jesus, I encourage you today to start your relationship and your fellowship with him today at this very moment. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that who would ever believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And he did this, why? When did he do this? Well, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. What a kindness, what a grace, what a mercy that has been extended to us as we navigate through life and try to understand how do I become acceptable to God? How can I get to God? How can I be pleasing to God? How can I even have a relationship with God? God was the one who took the first step that while we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And we didn't deserve it because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But yet it was his mercy and grace that he revealed himself through Christ Jesus. He came and preached the gospel to those that were near and those that were far off. He suffered, bled, and died in our place, taking on our penalty for our sin. And God raised him from the dead. And because, uh, and all those that trust in him, all those that believe in him, receive grace, mercy, and salvation from God, recognizing that we are sinners and that we were in need of a savior. And it is through the work of Christ that we have come to have a relationship with God. Well, pastor, what do I do? What do I do? How can I come into this fellowship with Christ? Believe on Christ Jesus. Believe in this message. Believe in this gospel. Believe in the word of God. Believe in the love of God that has come and been made manifest. Believe in the righteousness of God that has been revealed in the person of Christ Jesus. No, believe that he is God and that he is fully man. Believe in him and turn away from him. Believe him. Receive his spirit. Receive him and he will empower you to turn away from your sin and to live a righteous lifestyle. Believe in the Son and turn away from your sin. You'll know this word as repentance. It means to turn away, have a different mindset, change your mind, change your course of action. Trust in God. Know that God is God and turn away from sin and say yes to God. And, and then connect, if you will, to a Bible-believing church. Connect to a fellowship where you can grow in that relationship, where you can grow in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and continue to have fellowship, sweet communion with him. I'm trying to tell you, I've been in this journey for a while and it gets sweeter as the day goes by. Yeah, there may be tough days, but it gets sweeter as the day goes by. So, my friend, seek the Lord, call on the name of the Lord and do it now. 
Let's pray together. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for how Christ Jesus has come into the earth to reveal to us righteousness from heaven, to reveal to us God. He is the perfect and exact imprint of the nature of God. And when we look to Jesus, we are looking into God, Jesus being fully God and fully man and by and manifesting the perfect will of God here in the earth. We thank God for the life of Jesus. We thank God for the person of Jesus. We thank him for his love toward us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us and died in our place and took on our penalty, took on our sin, and he raised from the dead so that all who believe in him will be in right standing and right relationship with God. Thank you for loving us and serving us. Thank you, Jesus, for gracing us and calling us to yourself. Lord, I pray for anyone who's under the sound of my voice who does not know you, that your spirit would draw them because no man come to the Father except the spirit of the Lord. Draw them to you. Draw by your power. Draw by your spirit and draw by your word. Save that man. Save that woman. Save that boy. Save that girl by the power of your spirit and grow them in the faith that they will trust in Jesus and not hope in anything in this world. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask all these things to be done in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you.